starting a little bit um, late this round. But I'll try to take them off 45 minutes or so and see how it goes. Yep, so this discussion is about testing web applications uh, with Spring Framework 3.2 and some of the new features we added over the past year in the pre two releases. Um, I assume everyone was here this morning for the keynote, so I won't really talk about myself other than I'm a Java developer and a Spring consultant with the company I founded in Zurich called Swiftline. And I'm a core Spring committer. Um, especially important for this talk is that I am the author of the Spring Test Fundex framework. So for Spring 2.5, I completely rewrote all the testing support that had previously been in Spring, and I've been um, updating it, adding new features, and maintaining it ever since. Um, but one point about the, the code today, um, I did about half of it, and the other half was done by a guy named Russell Spiranza, who's a full-time uh, Spring Source employee, and he did the actual Spring ABC test part since he actually maintains and develops uh, Spring ABC. So, uh, show of hands, um, who here now has actually used Spring in the, in the web, in the web here? Right. Okay, and who has used Spring's testing support, so integration testing support? Fewer people. Who has used Spring and VC test? The same people, wow, well, okay. So pretty cutting edge. All right, so the agenda, um, first we'll talk about the Spring test for next framework and upgrades that have been made to that, updates. Um, I'll refer to it in different ways, sometimes just the Spring Testing Framework, Test for Next Framework, etc. And the new Spring ABC test framework that's been integrated into Core Spring as of Spring 3.2. And at the end, we'll follow up with a QA and a if you have any questions. So, what's new in the, the Test for Next Framework, the TCL? Um, first and foremost, just some upgrades to libraries that are now supporting, or at least tested with, g 4. 11 and testing G652 because you can still use older versions um, back to J45 and then testing G6 something or other. Um, one of the main new features that's been uh, had been requested over many years and uh, I just never got around to developing, I did actually implement for Spring 3.2 is the ability to load a web application context. Yes? Uh, okay, I will try to speak more slowly. Um, loading the web application context is a big new feature. Um, also, this allows us to test both request and session scope beams. We'll see some examples of that. Um, another smaller feature is support for application context initializers, something added in Spring 3.1. We'll look at that as well. And uh, last but not least in this regard, um, loading context hierarchies was not added in Spring 3.2. Um, because I didn't finish the work, but I finished the work by 3.2.2, so it's uh, available as of 3.2.2. And there are some more um, smaller features and updates that were made in the testing framework and testing support in general. If you want more information, um, I don't have time in this 45 minutes to discuss it all, but Ross and I gave a, a talk back at uh, Spring 2, uh, Spring 1 2 GX in Washington, D.C. last year. You can find that online, um, and it has a lot more information there. So, one of the key things that we do again is the support for testing web applications. So to test a web application in Spring NBC, you probably want some way to load your web application context within your integration tests. So how can you tell the test context framework for Spring to do this, to load a web application context as opposed to a standard application context? The answer is quite simple. Just annotate your class with this new annotation called at web app configuration. That's the simple answer. Um, but a bit more details about that. So basically the presence of this annotation uh, tells Spring uh, that the application context loaded for your tests should be a web application context, meaning that it should know about like the server context, et cetera. And in the background, it configures some stuff for you. Um, well, allows you to configure stuff such as the, uh, the resource path for your web application. This will be used in the background by Spring's mock server context and the path defaults to source main web app. So if anyone's used Maven before and uh, built a web application with uh, the Maven archetype for web apps, you'd be familiar with this path, this source main web app is like, lies alongside source main Java, source main resources, source main web app should be the path to your web application, to the root of your, your war file, for example. And by default paths are file system folders. Um, that's in contrast to some other support spring. Uh, they are not class path uh, folders by default or in the class of resources. However, you can override that using the 
uh, class tab colon prefix. It's also uh, used throughout Spring Framework whenever you're referring to resources. Let's take a look at a few examples of using this app, web app configuration annotation. Um, typically, this will be used um, directly in conjunction with app context configuration, which is an annotation from the Spring Test Finance Memory that tells Spring how to load your application on it, uh, which configuration files, uh, in terms of XML files, or which configuration classes. So we see here, um, we're just declaring add web app configuration without any attributes or parameters, and the same with that context configuration without any attributes there. So what we want to notice here is what the defaults are. By default, as I mentioned, web app configuration will look in the file system um, for source main web app for that folder. And in contrast, context configuration will look in the class path, not the file system, but literally just look up a class path resource um, based on the name of the class, and then adding the dash content.xml suffix to that and then in the same package as this test class. So we have a contrast here. With the web app configuration, it, it, we determined it made, or decided it made more sense to look in the file system by default because that's how you're gonna be uh, building um, or maintaining your, your module within Maven structures, for example. And with context configuration, it makes more sense to have class path resources. Now, what if we add values here, attributes, without specifying whether it comes from the file system or the class path? Uh, then we see here with that web app configuration that the default uh, will be a file system resource. So relative to the to root of our JVM, so if you're running uh, an Eclipse or if you're running your main project, then it's going to be relative to the root of that project. And for context configuration, uh, again, this will be a class path resource. If you prefix it with the forward slash, it's going to look in the root of the class path. Otherwise, it would be a class path relative resource. Um, last but not least, in this uh, collection of examples here, uh, we see that we can override in both cases. So we can always override the default resource type, specify either class path colon in this case, or file colon in this case. And that's it for the, the basics with add web app configuration. It's basically telling Spring how to, uh, that you want a web application kind of loaded, and also where the root of your web application is. Now in the background, um, you might not need to, to use this directly, but sometimes Good to know how things work in the background. There's a, a test execution listener. So within the uh, test context framework, there's this uh, a listener API you can implement if you want. Um, however, normally you just use the ones out of the box for dependency injection, transactional support, and now this uh, new servlet support as well. So what this does <clears throat> is that uh, in the background, it sets up the uh, default thread level state in the request context holder, which is an internal detail in Spring MVC that you might be familiar with that. And it does that for each test method. Basically, so that when your test methods execute, that they have the right web context set up for them. Um, and to do this, it creates uh, several mocks. So this mock HTTP server request from the Spring Test Module, also the mock HTTP server response, and a, a server web request that kind of wraps those together. It also makes sure that you can inject uh, these mocks, so this mock response and the server request into your test instance. So in your test class, you can actually have that auto wired in and access that in order to configure the mocks. And at the end, as you would hope, it cleans up the thread level state, making sure that uh, you have tests running in isolation so one test doesn't adversely affect the next test. As an example, we see here so uh, WAC tests, whenever I say WAC, the existential web application context. Um, again, it's annotated with app web app configuration and app context configuration. And then uh, using Spring's app auto wide annotation, we can inject several of these uh, instances into our test instance. So for example, the web application context and the mock server context. Uh, we see another comment or additional comments here that these two are cached. So um, in case you're not familiar with the, the Spring test context framework, one of the big benefits of the test context framework as opposed to just loading an application context on your own within your integration test is that um, when you're using the test context framework, application contexts will be cached across the execution of your test. So across the execution within an individual test, so across test methods, but also within your test suite. So if you're running hundreds and um, hundreds of test methods against uh, the same application context or um, a small set of application contexts, those contexts will be cached and you won't have the uh, 
the negative uh, runtime performance hit of loading of reloading those application context. So this server context, this mock one, is directly associated with the web application context, and therefore those two are, are cached for you. Um, if you're interested in having that clear from the cache, you can look at the at dirty's context annotation. And then these other ones, so we have these three mocks. You can inject the mock session, mock request, mock response, and last but not least, the um, server web request can also be injected into your test. So we'll see some examples with the uh, session request code beams for how that can be useful. Who has actually used a session or request scope theme? A few people, okay. Well, I have here a quick little review. Um, basically, in, in Spring, uh, beans have uh, a scope to thread. Uh, typically, you'd say you have a singleton bean, following a singleton pattern, there's only one. Um, and you can say you want a prototype bean, so that you get a new bean each time. Your request is based on a certain blueprint. And then, in a web application, we have additional scopes. So we have one for the request, and that means that the life cycle of that bean or that component is tied to the current HTTP server request. So the user puts something in the browser, sends a request to the server, and then a bean gets created for that request, and the bean goes away after that request or after the response is sent back. And then for a broader scope, we have session scope, and that ties in, as you might expect, to the current HTTP session. So if you have a user that's logged on to your application, um, in a certain container like Tomcat, then for the life cycle of that, that session, you can have a component, a screen managed beam, that's tied to that session. Now in the past, it was um, rather challenging to, to test these things on your own. Um, you would have to do a lot of um, boilerplate code on your own. But now with this uh, new support, we'll see that it's uh, pretty easy to test this, pretty straightforward. So here we have some example XML configuration for Springs. So we have a user service. Uh, this user service has a reference here to a login action. And then if we look at the login action, we see that it has, well, just defined as normal, it takes some parameters, username and password. Um, but there's three important things to note. So first off, we say scope is request. Um, by default, it would have been a singleton bean. So we're saying we want it to be tied to the HTTP request scope. And uh, one thing that's required there in Spring is to use this AOP scope proxy. If you leave that out, it won't work what you expect. Um, if you want to go more about that, you can ask me later or look it up in the reference manual. But another thing to note here is this use of uh, hashtag, curly brackets, and then little expressions. Um, who's familiar with the Spring expression language? Fewer people? Okay. So this is uh, basically um, use of Spring's expression language to basically pull in dynamic values from somewhere and pass them in either as constructor arguments or properties. Here we see these are username and password are being passed in um, as constructor arguments, and they're pulling information from the current request. So this is actually the, the um, HTTP server request, and we're just invoking the get, uh, get parameter method on um, getting user and a password from the current request, passing that into our login action. This is just an example um, of how one could do something like this. The main point here to notice is that we have a user service, it's a singleton bean, there's only one of those, and it gets um, a reference to a login action that pulls information out of the current request. So now if we wanted to test that, we probably want to somehow set up the request, set up a, um, a test username and a test password in that request. And we can see here how we would do that. This one, uh, this example is using JUnit 4 and the JUnit at run with annotation. It's specifying the spring runner here, spring JUnit 4 class runner to say I want to use the Spring Test Connect framework in JUnit. And then we see these two annotations that we've seen before. So at context configuration says we want an application context loaded, and at web app configuration says we want uh, explicitly a web application context. And as I mentioned before, uh, when we have this configuration, we can auto-wire in the, the server request, for example. Um, we could also auto-wire in our user service. So in this case, the user service is the the SUT or the subject under test, so the thing we're trying to actually test. And we remember from the previous slide that the user service uses the login action, and the login action reads some information from the current request. So in our test, we could do something like this. With this mock HTTP server request, we can set up some, some test data, some test parameters. Here are the username and password. Then we can invoke a um, method on our subject under test, so in this case, uh, invoking the, the login user method on user service. We know that in the background, um, this method must somehow interact 
with the login action, and then we can assert some results. Uh, the main point here is though that we are loading the web application context, uh, having the, the mock request injected into our test instance, setting up the, the mock as we expect, um, executing our, our subject standard test, and then verifying some results. Similarly, we can do the same kind of thing with session scoped beans. Here we see again the user service, um, but this time it takes a reference to a user preferences bean. And again, we have a scope instead of a request. This time we have scope is equal to session. Again, it's a scope to proxy. And again, we are using a spell expression to access uh, the current HTTP session in the server container, pulling out an attribute from that. For example, here, the theme, maybe a, a UI theme that we need to display or do some, something with. Um, again, we have another example with JNN. Same setup at the top, specifying to use the Spring Runner. We want a, um, an application context, we want a web application context, and this time instead of injecting in the request, we can use add auto wire and have the mock HTTP session injected into our instance. And then um, again, like we saw before, uh, we can basically set up our expectations on the mock. Um, so with this session, set some attribute, uh, maybe setting the theme to blue, and then invoke our user service and assert the results. So the main point here is that in the past it was it was somewhat difficult. There was a lot of work that code you had to do on your own to get this set up. And now with this uh, new support for loading a web application context in the testing framework, you can have your uh, application context cached, and you can easily inject in the session the request, set up your expectations, and then invoke your code that uses either session or request scope means. Moving on. This application context initializer, as I mentioned before, this is an interface introduced in uh, Spring 1. What it does, it allows you to programmatically initialize or configure your application context. So in this is a configure application context. Um, typically this is done uh, if you want to register some custom property sources or um, activate certain profiles um, against the environment. So again, new features in, in Spring 1. And um, normally this is done for a web application. So a web application using Spring MVC, for example, um, there's first class support in WebXML uh, for the context loader listener. So if you're configuring your root web application context, you can specify a context parameter named context initializer classes, and then the fully qualified package name of some classes you've written that implement this uh, application context initializer. And similarly for, for Spring MVC, uh, for Spring REST, et cetera, you can um, Configure your dispatcher servant with an init param, passing it uh, context initializer classes to tell it which initializers to use to create the application context for your Spring MVC dispatcher. And we want to use these in the tests. So again, uh, this application context initializer interface was from Spring 3.1, and the testing support for it was introduced in Spring 3.2. So with this uh, add context configuration annotation, there's now a new Initializer's attribute has been added to that. Um, I think it allows you to configure basically um, an array of initializers or a single initializer uh, by specifying the class. And by default, these initializers will be inherited uh, in a test class hierarchy, and you can control that if you need to via the inherit initializers flag, uh, for example, setting that to false. Something that's also new is that in the past, uh, initially you had to spe specify XML locations. Um, then you were allowed to specify XML locations or configuration classes with support for Java config. And now with this, um, you can leave off, uh, if you want to, the XML locations or the annotated uh, classes and just specify application context initializers that will configure your application context if you want to somehow programmatically set up your entire application context. And in terms of caching, I mentioned before that your application context will be cached across indications of test methods across test classes in your test suite. And these initializers also play a role in that, uh, in the context cache key, so determining uniqueness of an application context. So Spring knows when to cache, or when to look, or how to look up, um, or possibly already cache application context. And in terms of ordering, um, if you specify more than one initializer, there has to be a um, deterministic execution order. This is true in production and also in, in tests, and that's controlled by um, Spring's order interface or by the presence of the add order annotation on those initializers. 
So here's an example. Again, it's um, a genuine example with a run with and specifying the spring water. This time with that kind of configuration, we're specifying um, an explicit location here. And we're specifying some initializers. So again, there's just an array of uh, class references to initializers that we want to uh, test with. So maybe we're using these initializers in our, in our web application context um, in production. And we want to make sure that our tests, um, that the application context loaded for our test is initialized the same way. Or maybe we have some special kind of a test initialization that we want to do with the application context. We could also write that in an initializer. Context hierarchies. Um, I mentioned before, right, there's a, a root web application context and there's a dispatcher application context in your typical Spring VC application. Um, but traditionally, in, in the testing framework, uh, we only supported flat, non hierarchical context. So just, just one level. You could have specified multiple configuration uh, files, but those would all be merged just as in production, and then you'd have one application context for your integration test. Um, this meant that there was no easy way to set up a parent child relationship uh, for your context, um, even though this is supported in production and, in fact, very typical in a Spring MVC web application. So, the question is, would it be nice if you could test them too? And the answer is yes, as I mentioned, add the support in 3.2.2. And to configure this, there's a new annotation. There's an at context hierarchy annotation, which is used in conjunction with the existing at context configuration annotation. In addition, the, um, the at context configuration annotation has been augmented with a new name attribute. Um, typically, you don't even need to set this, but if for some reason you need to either merge or override um, configuration within a hierarchy across um, a test class hierarchy, then you can specify names and then you can refer to, to names at other levels and override or uh, merge. As an example here, we have a single class, test class, so this is not a test class hierarchy. There's no inheritance in terms of Java inheritance. But with the use of that context hierarchy, we do have inheritance in the application context. So the constellation of contexts that we have loaded for the test uh, will first have one uh, loaded from parent.xml and one loaded from child.xml. So if you visualize that in, kind of in memory in your mind, you have a parent application context and a child application context, and the child references the parent. So that would be analogous to your root web application context and your dispatcher application context in the WebMVC application. Here we see a more fleshed out example, so a bit more, more um, detail with three classes uh, in class hierarchy. So we started at the top of an abstract web test, and we're specifying here, yes, we want to run it with uh, Jane, with the Spring Runner, we want our web application context loaded, and we want this context configuration. So with this application context, we want this XML file to be used at the base of our tests and at the top if you want to think about it in terms of hierarchy. Now, if we have some classes that extend from that, so here we have a SOAP web service tests and a REST web service tests. Both of these classes extend this abstract web test, specifying this new annotation at context hierarchy and each time specifying their own context kind of configuration. So uh, this makes sense here. For the uh, SOAP one, we have SOAP WS config. And for the rest one, we have REST WS config. What you end up with there, when you run this, uh, this set of tests, you would end up with three application contexts that are loaded and captured. Right? You'd have this, this parent one at the top for application context. You would have then two child contexts. So SOAP WS and REST WS, and each of these would point to the parent application context. Another thing to point out here is that um, at the top, we actually don't have context hierarchy. So we have add context hierarchy at this level, add context hierarchy at this level, and in this abstract web tests, we don't specify add context hierarchy. Um, we could have, but you don't have to. And the reason I point that out is that you might have some existing um, abstract based test classes or some existing classes you're extending from that already declare um, application context and are used in different ways within your uh, test suite. You can continue to use those and extend from them. And as, as soon as you specify at context hierarchy at one level in your test class, then that test class and any subclasses will um, participate in a context hierarchy. So I guess another point there is, uh, don't be confused that just because 
you don't see that context, that context hierarchy at the top, that if a subclass includes it, then you will actually end up with a hierarchy. That's kind of a thing to note so that you don't get confused if someone else wrote the configuration, for example. So that's it for the, the updates to uh, Spring, the Spring Test Connection in general, and, and the basic web support. And for the, the second half, we'll be talking about uh, the new Spring MVC test framework. So what is Spring MVC test? Uh, first and foremost, it's a dedicated support for testing your Spring MVC applications, obviously. Um, it has a nice fluent API, which is really uh, comfortable to use, uh, very easy to write, hopefully easy to understand as well. And it includes both client and server-side support. So for testing things, uh, you're developing on the server-side or your client uh, web interactions. Sorry. Um, another nice thing to note is that it does not actually require a server container, so it's an out-of-container integration test, which means it's going to run very uh, relatively quickly and can tie into the nice caching mechanisms of the Spring Test Connection as well. Um, some of the details. It is actually included in Spring 22 as part of the Spring test launch, so alongside the uh, test connect framework and existing mocks, etc. And it builds on the test connect framework for the loading your uh, MVC application connects, as we just saw in previous slides with the new add uh, web app integration, annotation, etc. And it also uses um, the existing mocks that we have for requests and response. Um, within the Spring Test module. Those have actually been around for years, and they're just used um, internally within the Spring MVC test framework. So when you're executing um, server-side tests, this actually involves um, a real dispatcher server. In fact, it's a, it's a subclass of that, but for all practical purposes, it uses a real dispatcher server. It's, of course, not a real request. It's not an HTTP request. It's not going through a server container, but it starts at the interception point of the dispatcher server. So it, in that sense, you'll be using your real spring configuration. Uh, your controllers will be actually executed, they would be in production. Uh, your mappings will be handled the same way, etc. So it's almost like running it in the container, just without the, uh, the startup time and the maintenance or having to have um, a, a running uh, container for your tests. On the client side, so we want to test um, or for code that uses uh, REST, we uh, can use the REST template. We can also use that with the, the testing framework, and we'll see that towards the end. Bit about the history, um, where it came from. Some of you might have heard about it before we actually released it with Spring 3.2. So um, it evolved at first as an independent um, project on, on GitHub at Spring Source Spring Test MVC. Um, but we did integrate it fully into Spring 3.2 with uh, the new ability to load a web application context with uh, the caching and the um, test context framework. But the, uh, the whole project there, Spring Test MVC, still exists. Um, and still supports Spring 3.1. So if you want to use some of this functionality, maybe not exactly as you see here in, this, in the following slides, um, but there is still, what's good to know, there's still support for Spring 3.1 using the, the old uh, version here. So if you want to see some examples, here we have one combining some of the stuff we've seen before. Uh, sample tests, again, JUnit run with the, uh, the Spring Runner. Um, again, we want a web application context, so we say at web app configuration, and here we're saying at context configuration specifying, for example, on um, server context. Now, what we're doing, we saw this, so we, do this, we saw earlier that we can do this using at AutoWire to have the web application context injected directly into the test, um, and that's actually very, very important here, uh, as we see in this uh, before method, so this JUnit at before in our setup method, we have a mock MVC instance, this is from the Spring MVC test framework. And we're going to instantiate it with a, this is a nice um, static method that's been imported. So this app, sorry, this web app context setup, and it needs a reference to the web application context. So this, this dot .wac is referencing the web application context that's loaded for us and cached for us by the test framework configured here via, via JUnit. There's some other options here we'll see in a minute. Here we just say build, and we have access to this, to this mock MVC uh, instance. And within our tests, so for example here, we want to test our, um, our foo uh, get request to the path slash foo. So we can just say mvc.perform get slash foo. Um, and also to send with that request, we want to send uh, accept headers of application JSON. And then 
once that request is executed in our screen we see application after it's gone through to the controller and the controller has returned then we can add some expectations so here we see and expect that the status is okay so the status of, of 200 was returned in terms of HTTP response codes uh, here we can say and expect a particular content type specifying a, a MIME type and we can expect um, JSON path uh, that we pull out some value out of the JSON path if this controller should have returned um, JSON. You know about the fluent API usage. I mentioned that that, that one method was a, a static method. And to make this nice and, and, and pretty and readable within your code, you're going to want to use the uh, static imports. So for example, import static, in, uh, mocking VC request builders, get, etc. Um, then you have some nice stuff here. So this get and status, you don't have to explicitly reference where they come from. And if you want that to work nicely, for example, in Eclipse with control space, with nice code completion in your IDE, then you can add these as what are called favorite, favorite static members and Eclipse preferences, Java editor, Confuses, favorites. So it's highly recommendable. Also for things like uh, even your or change and assert for hand press matches, etc. So for the server side, um, to recap on that, the actual screen that we see configuration will be loaded. So there's application context or potentially um, Java configuration classes that you reference with add context configuration. Those will load your app or configure your actual screen we see configuration. Um, and in the background, a mock request is prepared for you. And then when you actually um, perform either the get or the post or whatever operation against your, your controllers, then it actually executes, executes against this dispatcher server in the background. Then on the other side, your assertions will be applied to the resulting uh, mock response that's managed for you in, in the background. So you might ask yourself, is this integration testing or is this unit testing, I'm not starting a real Tomcat uh, server container or, or Jetty server container, so maybe it's unit testing. Um, and we're also using mocks, right? So there's some, some mocks, we saw the mock request and mock response to the server container. It sounds kind of like unit testing, um, but in actuality, you're really starting up a spring application context. So you basically kind of have a spring container, if you want to look at it like that. Um, you are, are interacting with the dispatcher server and your actual spring UBC configuration. So in that sense, this is an integration test between your code, between your controller, Spring, Spring is running, and your Spring configuration. But at the same time, it's, it's not truly uh, fully end-to-end -end testing, so this doesn't replace something like, like Selenium if you have some needs like that. But at the same time, um, it does provide uh, a really high level of confidence in your Spring VC layer in terms of the configuration, but also in terms of, of your things like mapping, um, content, a MIME content type support, um, automatic type conversion, uh, marshalling, and other things like that. So in other words, you can really test a lot of the functionality of your Spring UBC application or your Spring UBC REST application without deploying it to a container. In terms of uh, strategies, you should um, focus on testing the Spring UBC web layer alone. That's a standard testing strategy, like focus on one layer or one unit or as small a piece of the application as you can. And to do that, you would then want to um, inject into your controllers uh, mock services or mock repositories. So whatever um, collaborators your controllers have, you want to mock those out uh, following a standard uh, Pojo programming model, programming interfaces, makes it easy to provide mocks. And you want to thoroughly test your screen receipt uh, configuration and the code. So it's not, not just the code, it's not just a unit test for the code. You want to test the configuration, make sure that you've configured the spring you can see the way that you think you have so that your request mappings are right, so that you're marshaling and automatic type conversion things are happening as you expect. In terms of mocks, who actually uses mocks? Are you guys using JMock? EasyMock? Makita? Okay. All right. So, um, since we're actually learning uh, the real screen, let me see can pick. We first want to declare um, a mock dependency for things like our, our services or repositories. And here we have an example. So here we have a, a Bean uh, class uh, using work Mokito 
Mojito and specifying a factory method for this. Uh, so this is Mojito.mock is basically what will be invoked, and we're passing a, a fully qualified pass name of a class name of the, the repository or the data access object that we want to mock out in this case. And hopefully everyone's at least maybe familiar with the, the concept of a factory in terms of design patterns. So this will create an instance of type foodal, and then you can have that foodal injected into your food service, et cetera, and to your test as well, or into your controller. Yes. And then in terms of uh, expectations on the mock, you can uh, set this up via add before, add test, and add after methods, et cetera, uh, just like you would any other mock. But you can figure this, yes? Can I have a question? Uh, just um, in practice, uh, at uh, AutoWire does not uh, work with uh, this uh, this type of mocking. Just because... Are you sure? As a 3.2? Because I, I fixed it. Yes. In most cases, mm -hmm. it argues that there is no bin with a matching type. It works with add resource, just because it first checks for the name and then gets gets at you, the actual type. Have you really tested it in 3.2? Yes. Yes. 3.2.3, yes. Three, two, three. Yeah, 3.2.3 has been what? Well, then show me. Because then it's, then it's a, a bug. If you do it like this and it doesn't work, then it's a bug because I wrote code in 3.2 that fixes that. It doesn't work. Okay. Show me. Show me later. I have some more work to do. Um, if you're talking about, there's one situation where it doesn't work, but if you're doing it just like that, it really definitely work. So, uh, what can be tested? Uh, we've seen a few things, but we'll talk more detail now. Uh, we can test the response status, so like the code, both 200, etc. Um, headers that were returned, and the content. And we should really focus on um, asserting these kind of things first, because that's actually what's going to be sent back to the user, or that's kind of the focus of actually generating some kind of content. But if you need to, you can also um, test some SpringMVC and server-specific results. For example, in terms of SpringMVC, you could uh, work with a SpringMVC model, um, flash scope, session scope, request attributes, etc. And you can also test the map control methods and interceptors, and you can verify whether or not exceptions are properly resolved based on your configuration. There are also various options for um, asserting a response body, so the content using the JSON path, XPath, XML unit, et cetera, and also um, various handfast matchers, so you can even provide in, in your own custom matcher if you want to. But what about the view layer? So we haven't really talked much about that. Um, in general, all view templating technologies will, uh, are supported, so if you're using stuff like free marker, velocity, um, time leap, et cetera, uh, even, even things like JSON, XML generation, PDF generation, those should all work, just as you'd expect in a real container. Um, the caveat is, uh, JSPs will not work because we're not running in a server container, as I mentioned before, so we don't have the, the JSP compiler there to actually compile your code and, and invoke it. But, um, on the positive side, you can assert which JSP was selected. So if you had a, a forward or a redirect or something, you could verify that that happened as you expected. And in terms of re redirection forward, there is no actual redirection forward since we're not in the container. Um, but you can verify that an attempt was made to redirect to a particular URL or forward to a particular URL. Some other uh, features that are available, um, experimental features, so support for HTML unit and um, Selenium drive integration. If you're interested in that, you can check out the SpringWC HTML unit project. It's a repository on um, Spring Sources GitHub repository. Now, debugging, there's this handy little feature here. If you add in after your, your perform statement, uh, and do print, then you're saying uh, basically uh, print everything uh, that happens in terms of this request and response processing within the uh, screen test or screen VC test framework, and that will print that out to the system out. Uh, so if you have any issues, it's uh, kind of easier to look at that than it is to try to debug all the internals of, of screen VC and the dispatcher server, et cetera. And you can also debug into breakpoints if you want, but this is a really quick way to take a look and see what, what's happening. In terms of configuration, um, we also have standalone setup, 
And what that means is that we're not providing our own screen provision. Uh, instead, we want the defaults for Spring MVC to be used. And to do, or when we do this, we're going to test one controller at a time. So we're not testing uh, potentially multiple controllers uh, loaded in our application connects. Rather, we're focusing on one particular controller, and we'll see that on an example. The way we do that is we provide a, a reference to the controller instance. And we can do it like this. So here we have uh, redirect tests, uh, mock MVC, we need an instance of that in our setup. Instead of pulling the, instead of creating a mock MVC instance from the web application context loaded by the testing framework, we're just saying here, uh, standalone setup for this given controller, so passing it an instance of a particular controller. Then in our actual test method, this looks the same or similar to what we had before. So uh, here performing a post with some parameters, expecting um, particular status to move temporarily, and expecting a redirect URL. So your actual test methods will look the same. The difference here is that you are loading a standalone setup, and Spring MVC test is creating, um, again, this batch server in the background, and a little miniature uh, MVC configuration for you using all of the, the defaults. Now, if you have any needs to override some defaults, you can override those here. In addition, you can uh, also set up server filters. So if you have your own server filters you've written and you want to see how that they're interacting uh, properly, you can configure those via the add filters method here, passing in a uh, bar list of, of filters there. Um, another testing case uh, use case is if you're using Spring Security, for example, if you're having a Spring uh, Security configuration loaded, you can basically take the Spring Security filter chain and pass that in to the add filters method and make sure that Spring Security is executed in your integration test as well. Are we on time? Five minutes. Five minutes. How many slides do I have? We'll see. All right. Um, moving on. So we want to reuse. Um, some configuration, maybe we have some configuration we find ourselves typing all the time. Uh, we don't want to violate the dry principle, so the do not repeat yourself principle. We want to reuse some configuration. So in our setup method, we can set up things like default request um, and always expect. And then in our actual tests, we could override those if we wanted to, or just rely on the defaults that we've set up um, for all of our uh, common needs. Now, there are times when you need access to the underlying MVC result. So up to now, we've had a small MVC, uh, but we've just had things like here, perform and expect, and we were done. We didn't actually interact with the, the result on our own. Um, in this case, MVC result, we want to take that. We can actually get hold of the request and response, uh, the model and view. And for example, if you're testing asynchronous execution uh, support, you want to get hold of the, the MVC result and make sure that the, uh, the code was invoked asynchronously. Now we're moving on to client side, the rest of the, all that before is server side, now we're talking about client side. Uh, we'll create a Spring MVC REST template, just as we normally would. And now instead of the mock MVC, we're using this mock REST service, ser uh, service server, create server, passing a reference to the REST template. And then on that mock server, we have some uh, things, some analogous to what we had before, but we're expecting our code to uh, perform a request to this path and to respond with, uh, for example here, with success uh, and the, the mime type, et cetera. Then we would invoke our, our client code that we've written that uses this REST template, and at the end we can call verify on that mock server to make sure that our client code, our subject on the test, did in fact interact with the REST template uh, in the ways that we specified. So, um, you're using an instance of REST template, uh, just as you normally would, but in the background it's getting configured with uh, some custom client HD request factory uh, that's responsible for recording and asserting uh, the expected results instead of actually executing them. So you're not going to literally talk to any kind of remote server. It's just going to basically um, catch those requests and record them. And then your code that uses the REST template can, can use the REST template as it normally would. So, um, one slide acknowledgement. If some of this code looks familiar to you, maybe you use Spring Web Services, and Spring Web Services has a similar testing framework uh, with a nice fluid API, and in fact, the Spring MVC test support uh, was, was inspired by that code base. In closing, um, just like to say special thanks to my 
colleague and friend Russell Toyota, the uh, lead for SpringMVC, who allowed me to reuse some of his slides on SpringMVC test and for some further resources. Uh, hopefully, those who are familiar with springsource.org, so the, the home for Spring projects and uh, Core Spring is, of course, under Spring Framework. Uh, forms, I mentioned previously, if you have any uh, questions or want to interact with some other developers, you can go to the official forums or perhaps look at, at Stack Overflow and search there post questions, and if you find any, any bugs or have any um, things you'd like to recommend, please, by all means, uh, log in to, to Jira, create an account, and then let us know what you find. And if you'd like to contribute, I highly recommend you check out the repository of GitHub. There's a nice set of uh, wiki pages there, uh, guidelines on how to become a contributor, um, guidelines on how to submit um, a reproduction issue project, for example. In terms of Spring MC test resources, um, there's a nice blog post from, from Russell Sayon's if you were to click here, and I'll make these two slides available. Um, also in terms of samples, so there's this uh, Spring MVC Showcase collection of examples that's available on, on GitHub, and that has been reworked to use the Spring MVC uh, test framework for testing some of the Spring MVC code. Um, and there are also some example server tests and client tests that are part of the actual um, Spring testing suite. And uh, reference documentation has been has been updated. So within the testing chapter um, of the Spring Reference Manual for Spring V2, there's a, a new uh, set of sections covering this uh, web testing support as well as the Spring VC test support. In terms of blogs, um, I have my, my company blog where I blog about uh, every now and then usually for Spring release about the newest features in the um, testing framework. And there's also, of course, the Spring Source team blog for. Uh, all the core news and updates about new features and not only core spring but any of the spring portfolio projects. So that's it. If you'd like to contact me, here's how you can do it. Here's how you can look at my slides that I've published on SlideShare. Um, if you have any questions? Yeah, just just one. You mentioned this JSON bass uh, stuff. And it has its own dependency. It's uh, some external. It's an external framework, yes. Yeah, but um, it's kind of weird. So you're just starting to use it, and you get exception with the class class not found. Ah. Uh, are you planning to I don't know include it or no? Um, there wouldn't be any plan to do So whenever there's a reference to a third party library, it's a, it's an optional dependency, meaning that you can use that module. So the Spring Test module is the same with like with JUnit and, and TestNG. If you don't have JUnit and you try to use Agron with and, and run it and put something in it, it wouldn't wouldn't work, right? You couldn't. Um, I guess you're saying the difference is that you don't see a um, a compile time dependency, it's a, it's a runtime dependency. But um, things like that we wouldn't wouldn't include because there's so many developers that use the test module uh, for other reasons that have nothing to do with the web and JSON. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you going to support JSPs in some way in the future? Not that I know of. It's, uh, it's rather, it's a lot more challenging to, to have the JSPs compiled and all that. It requires a lot more dependencies. It's going a lot, or a lot farther beyond the, the notion of, a, of an out of container integration test. It's really much more like in container at that point. It's one of the, the downsides of JSP in general. That's why a lot of people really like things more like time and free markers and stuff. Thank you. Uh, in some of my previous projects, uh, Spring test uh, with JUnit. Uh, after some point, we decided to move to TestNG. Mm -hmm. But just replacing the runner from JUnit to TestNG uh, does not work. Uh, uh, some part of uh, stuff uh, just stopped to initialize. Is it something on our side, or it's uh, uh, <laughs> is it supposed to work? It's if you extended one of the, the TestNG based classes when you when you when you over, what you're saying. We use run with uh, uh, GUnit runner, and mm -hmm. we uh, want to move to testing G runner. There's no testing G runner. In testing G, you have to extend one of the, the abstract base classes. So, um, in theory, it's supposed to work exactly the same, except for one thing, and that's it's a known um, issue that uh, timed transactional tests don't work in testing G. Um, but I doubt that that's what you're doing, since very few people do timed transactional tests. Um, but otherwise, it should work the same. If it doesn't, then, then that would be a bug. And I would appreciate it if you create a jury issue or a bug there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Your own Spring Runner. So it's not actually intended that you would write your own um, Spring Runner per se. Um, the test conduct framework is uh, written to be agnostic of the testing framework that's used. So the runner is just a way to incorporate it in JUnit. And in testing G, we have these abstract base classes um, where you can basically um, orchestrate the tests on your own. The core is a test context manager. You have to instantiate one of those at the correct time and then invoke methods on it at the right time. So one example would be to look at the abstract base classes for test and G. Um, that shows how you kind of programmatically. And in terms of uh, the runner, uh, what I would say in either case, it, it's possible that you'll um, be able to achieve what you want to by writing your own, either your own test execution listener or writing your own application code initializer. So maybe one of those two things might be um, a better alternative than to trying to write your own runner. Um, and as I was talking guys earlier, um, for 4.0, I want to make any promises, but um, it is uh, on my, my plate of things to look at to come up with a solution using JUnit's at rule implementation and at rule mechanism as opposed to using uh, the JUnit runner mechanism. Thank you. So I think that's probably uh, time. She's not flagging this down, but yeah. I'll be honest.